Hi, today we're going to be learning about tally marks and frequency tables. We're going to start off by looking at what tally marks are. Tally marks are a very useful way of keeping track of numbers as you are counting. They form groups of five, which means that it's easy for you to see at a glance what number the tally marks represent. Here's an example where we've got the number 18 being represented with tally marks. So you can see you've got four downstrokes and then the fifth one crosses over and that forms a group of five. So as you're counting, you'll go one, two, three, four, and then the fifth one you cross over, then that's five, then six, seven, eight, nine, and then you cross over for the 10th one, then 11, 12, 13, 14, and you cross over for the 15th one, and then 16, 17, 18. So this is very useful when you're counting something where the number is increasing all the time then you can just keep track of it with these little strokes. And because of the fact that they are grouped into fives, it means that when you then want to go back and see what the number is that it's representing, it's just not its not just a whole lot of little lines all next to each other. Because they're grouped in fives like this, it makes it easier to actually identify what that number is without having to go and count every single little stroke that you made. You can count in fives. You can have 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. Now we know that the, there are 18 without having to count all of them individually. Okay, so that's what tally marks are. The next thing we're going to look at is frequency. Now frequency is the number of times a particular data value occurs. So if you are counting uh, the number of, or if you're counting people's favorite fruit or something, and one of the items is apples, then if there are five people that like apples, then the frequency for apples is five. So the frequency is the number of times that a particular data value occurs. Now a frequency table is a table that is used to organize and count data. It can include a tally column where we actually, while we're collecting the data, we are making a tally of the items as we're collecting the data. And then once you've completed the tally, you also will then have a frequency column where you can then add up and write down the number of items for each of the different categories that you are collecting data for. Okay. So here's an example of a frequency table. So here you've got pets that people have and we've got a tally. So this is showing over here that this many people have cats, this many people have dogs, this many people have birds and so on. So once you've done the tally, while well, the tally is what you do while you're collecting the data, then once you've done that tally, you can then count it all up and you can fill in the frequency. So this number tells us how many this is. So you can say 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that's 14. Here I've got 18 because it's 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. Here it's 11, 5, 10, 11. Then here this is just 5. This is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, and 1. So your frequency column over here is basically the total for each of the different categories that you have in your data set. And then at the bottom over here, you also can add up all the frequencies to get the total number of data values altogether. So in this case, I added up the 14 and the 18 and the 11 and the 5 and the 9 and the 3 and the 1, and that gave me 61. So that's telling me that there were 61 pets that were being counted all together. Okay, so that is what a frequency table looks like. So now you you're going to have a chance to create your own frequency table. So over here, this is our first activity. Tando was interested in finding out about the popularity of different car colors. He decided to investigate this by collecting and analyzing data. He sat on the side of a street for half an hour and took note of all the cars that drove past him. The colors of the cars he saw were as follows. And here we have got a whole lot of different colors listed as they drove past him, he took note of the colors that were driving past him. Okay, so what if you don't have the worksheet that goes with this lesson, then you should pause the video now quickly to copy down all of these values, and then you can come back and continue. Okay, so let's go on now. Over here, this is the frequency table that you're going to be completing. Again, if you don't have it, please quickly copy it down, pause the video, copy it down so that we can then go on and fill it in. Okay, so now you are going to take that 
data that we had over here and you are going to fill in the frequency table. Now I'm going to start it off for you so that you can see how you can go about this. Okay, so over here I have got all of those different color cars that he saw and here I've got the frequency table that we're going to be filling in. So let me just show you how you can go about actually doing the tally to, to just get you started. Now what I always recommend when you're doing the tally is as you are doing it to cross off the things that you have already done. Otherwise you can get confused and you might end up redoing things or not knowing if you've done them and so on. So we're going to just start off going through it systematically. So the first one is white. So I'm going to cross that off and I'm going to make a tally mark for white. Then I've got silver. So that's going to go over there. Then I've got yellow, which is over here. And then I've got white, which is over here. So now I'm going to let you continue with that. So you're going to go and complete that tally. Once you've done the tally, you then need to go and fill in all the frequencies and the total. And then we'll get on to the questions after that. Okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes to complete this frequency table. Okay, so let's see what you got for that frequency table. Your frequency table should look something like this. Okay, so you should have two for red, one for orange, three for yellow, two for green, eight for, bl for blue, three for purple, one for pink, one for black, 12 for white, nine for silver, and three for gold. And you should have found the total number of cars altogether was 45. Okay, so now that we've got the frequency table filled in, now you're going to go and answer some questions about the data. Okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes to work on these questions.
Okay, so let's quickly go and take a look at how you would have answered these questions. So over here, the first question is which color is most popular? So now we want to see which color had the highest frequency. So that is this one over here is 12, that was white. The next question, which colors are least popular? So now we're looking for the colors that have the lowest frequency. So that's the one, one, and one. So that over there is orange, pink, and black. The next question, how many cars did Tando see all together? So this one is our total over there. That is 45 cars. Okay. And then the last question over here, before we get onto these ones, what percentage of the cars were silver? The percentage that were silver, first of all, we need to see how many cars were silver. That was nine. So that's nine out of the total, which is 45, and we already know how to work our percentages. We're going to multiply that by 100. So that's going to give us nine, nine divided by 45 times 100 is 20%. So 20% of the cars were silver. Right, Tando wishes to use this data to predict car color popularity in South Africa. Would he be able to do this and why? Now, in this particular example, he only sat there on one street for, 40, for half an hour and he watched the cars that went past and he saw 45 cars. Now, there are an enormous number of cars in South Africa. Basing his prediction on the car popularity for the whole of South Africa just on the 45 cars that he saw is not going to be very accurate because he had a very small sample size. So no, he would not really be able to do it because it was a very small sample. And we're still going to be talking about what samples are. Then, how could Tando improve his data collection to be able to make better predictions? He can improve his data collection by increasing the sample size. And to do that, he can watch cars for a longer period of time. Watching He can also make sure that he watches at different times of the day and in different locations. And now we're going to go on and talk about populations and samples. First of all, populations. A population is the entire group that you want to draw conclusions about. So like in this last example that we had, the population would be all the cars in South Africa. He wants to find out about the popularity of the car colors for all the, car the cars in South Africa. He's, he's wanting to draw conclusions about that. So that's the population. That's what he wants to be able to draw conclusions about. Now, he obviously cannot go and look at every single car in South Africa. It would not be physically possible. So instead, you look at a sample. A sample is a specific group that you look that you will collect data from. Ideally, the sample should be chosen randomly and should also be representative of the population. So that's why I said in the last example that, first of all, he should be getting a, a larger sample. We're going to be talking about sample size next. But also, he should be getting data not only from one location, he should be getting data from other locations and also other times of the day because it would give a better representation of the population. If he's wanting to gather data about all the cars in South Africa, he should be looking at different places, not just one place. And then the sample size, like in the last example, he can't make predictions about all the cars in the whole of South Africa based on just 45 cars that he saw in half an hour. What if he was sitting outside a particular car dealership that 
happened to have a lot of white cars at that particular time and people were test driving those cars so he happened to be seeing a lot of white cars we don't know the reasons that he saw the colors that he saw in that particular location at that particular time when he only saw 45 cars it doesn't give a very good representation of all the cars that are in south africa so you need to have a much bigger sample size to get a better idea of the population so the sample size will vary based on the size of the population if you're only wanting to find out about something where the population is only a thousand then you don't need to have as big of a sample size but if you are wanting to find out say about the whole of south africa's cars then you need to have a bigger sample size okay so the sample size will vary based on the size of the population but the general guideline is that it should be a minimum of 100 so like with what tando was doing he only had 45 cars that he saw that doesn't even meet the minimum and also there is a maximum as well you can't just do complete overkill and get enormous amounts of data because it would be too time consuming and wouldn't be cost effective so they you also have to cap your sample size at a certain point so the maximum is either 10 percent of the population now if you think of all the cars in south africa 10 percent of that would still be an unmanageable amount so there's another way of capping it and that is at a thousand so whichever one is lower you can do so if 10% of the population is lower, then you can cap it at that. Or if 1,000 is lower, then you can cap it at that as well. So anything between 100 and either 10% or of the population or 1,000 would be an appropriate sample size. Right, now let's have a look at intervals. Some kinds of data can be grouped into intervals or classes. Things like test marks or heights or weights or distances things like that, they can be grouped into intervals, things that are numerical. When grouping data into intervals, you need to follow a, a few rules. One of the rules is that the intervals must be consistent and equal in size. So you can't have one interval that is 10 and another interval is 100. They need to be the same. Also, intervals can't overlap. So you can't have one interval going from 5 to 10 and the next interval going from 9 to 15 or even from 10 to 15 because then they both include 10. So you can't have intervals overlapping. And then there mustn't be gaps between the intervals. So you can't have 5 to 10 and then nothing and then 15 to 20. You have to have intervals following on straight after each other. Right, so here's an example of some test marks from a class that wrote a test and if we take these marks and we put them into intervals then this is what our intervals could look like we could have intervals from 0 to 9 10 to 19 20 to 29 30 to 39 40 to 49 50 to 59 60 to 69 70 to 79 80 to 89 and 90 to 99 now if you look at this you'll see that nothing has been left out so even though there were no marks in this particular interval we don't leave it out we still write it there it is still one of the intervals okay so we don't have gaps also we don't have any overlapping so this isn't 0 to 10 and then 10 to 20 and then 20 to 30 because then we would have 10 there and there and we would have 20 there and there and we would have 30 there and there we can't have overlapping uh, intervals so we can't have anything that appears in one interval in another interval as well and also all the intervals are the same size all of them are from 0 to 9 or 10 to 19 that is a total of 10 this is also a total of 10 this is also a total of 10 now the intervals do not have to always be 10 you can have intervals of 20 or intervals of 2 or intervals of 100 whatever is appropriate for the data that you're working with okay so in this particular case the data i was working with it made sense to do intervals of 10 but that won't always be the case. If you are working with much bigger numbers, then intervals would, it would make more sense to do larger intervals. Uh, so you don't have so many intervals to work with. So the intervals will 
be based on the data that you've got, but you have to follow those rules. Okay, so now you're going to do an example for yourself. Over here, we've got the monthly rainfall in a particular region was measured in millimeters over a period of a few years, and the results were as follows. Now, once again, if you don't have the worksheets that go with this lesson, please quickly pause the video and copy these down. Okay, so now we're going to go and look at the frequency table that we are going to be filling in. But you'll see over here that there is nothing in this column over here. What you need to do is you need to look at the data that you've got over here. And you need to look at, first of all, find the minimum. Now, this over here is the minimum. That's the lowest number. It is 17. And you need to find the highest number out of all of this data. I think it was this one over here. It's 176. So you need to look at the range of numbers that you've got in the data that you've got over here and decide on appropriate intervals that you could use for this data. Okay, and you're going to have to fill that in over here. So now just be aware of how many spaces I've given you. I've given you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spaces. So that would be nine groups that you can create over here, nine intervals. Okay, and then once you've created your intervals, you need to then go and do your tally, just like we were doing before. And you're going to then do your frequency over here and the total. Okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes to work on this frequency table. Okay, so let's take a look at what your frequency table should have looked like. So over here, this is one possibility. Now, your, you may have chosen different intervals. This, these are the intervals that I chose. Okay, so I was having intervals of 20, which is what I would advise for this, for this data, because you had nine intervals that you could have. It was going 
from 17 all the way up to 176. So this allows you to have nine intervals from 0 to 179. Okay, so we've got 0 to 19, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, and so on. So in the first interval, I only had one. That's one over there. There's nothing in this one, nothing in this one. The, so those are both 0. Then over here, I had 5 in the 60 to 79. I had 6 in 80 to 99. I had 15 in 100 to 119. I had 14 in 120 to 139. I had 11 in 140 to 159. And I had 8 in 160 to 179. So as I said, your table may look a little bit different to mine, depending on the intervals that you use. And then, but you should still have got the same total of 60. Right, now we're going to go and answer a few questions based on this data. So these are the questions that you're going to be answering, and I'm going to give you two minutes to work on these questions. Okay, so let's go through and see how you would have needed to answer those questions. So over here, the first question is how many years was the rainfall measured for? So first, the number of this number 60 over here is not the number of years. Remember the rainfall was measured every month. So this is 60 months. Okay, so we need to work out how many years that is the same as. So to work out the number of years, we're going to divide by 12 because there are 12 months in a year. So it's going to be 60 divided by 12, which is five years. Okay, so that's what you should have got for that question. Next question, how many months had less than 80 millimeters of rain? So here's 80 over there. We need to know how many months had less than that. So that is all of these categories over here, 0 to 19, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, and 60 to 79. So first, 0 to 19 had one, one month only. There were no months with these over here. And then we had five in the 60 to 79 range. So we had one plus five, and that gives us six months. Then how many months had at least 120 millimeters of rain? At least means it can be more than 120. So it's 120 and anything that's more than that. So we've got over here, 120 was 14. 120 to 139 was 14 plus 140 to 159 was 11 plus 160 to 179 is 8. Okay, so that gives us 14 plus 11 plus 8 is 33 months. And then the last one, 
what rainfall measurement was an outlier, which means that it was much higher or much lower than normal. The normal amount of rain in a month was kind of in this sort of range over here. This one over here, the measurement that ended up in this category is an outlier because it's very far away from all of the other measurements that we had. Okay, it's out of the ordinary, it's not normal. So the measurement that ended up over here was the minimum amount, that was the 17 over there, that was 17 millimeters. So that is what we have as our outlier, that is completely out of the ordinary. Okay, it's much, in this case, much lower than all the rest of the readings that they got. Okay, so that's what an outlier is. It's a, a value that is very different to the other readings that you get. Now, just be aware, when you're doing questions like this in a test or something, be aware of what the mark allocation is. When you've got questions that require, even if it's just a very simple calculation, if the question is two marks, make sure that you show the calculation because you'll be giving a mark for the calculation for that question. Okay, so just make sure that you show it because you might not be given the mark for the calculation if you only write down the answer. So just be aware of that. And also, if you do happen to type something into your calculator incorrectly, then you could still get a mark for the calculation even if you got the final answer wrong. So make sure that you get used to showing your calculations even when they are very simple like this. And that is how we work with tally marks and frequency tables. Now that we've learned the concepts in this lesson, it's important to practice, practice, practice. If you haven't already got the worksheet that goes with this video, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description below. The worksheet comes with an extra exercise full of questions for you to work on to master the concepts covered in this lesson. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button so that others can benefit from it too. Also, be sure to subscribe so that you can easily find my other lessons and hit the bell so that you will get notified about lessons as I upload them.